So the second thing that I wanted to say was that I have to admit I feel somewhat uncomfortable today speaking about war in Eastern Europe simply because of course uh, uh, the ongoing war in Ukraine is probably on everybody's mind uh, and reviewing this talk on very classic Hollywood film from 1942 I was constantly reminded of the parallels to this war uh, but I, d I decided uh, that I will not talk about Ukraine at all uh, at least not explicitly, but I'm sure that if you want to f see parallels, uh, you'll find them. You'll find them very easily. Um, so just to be sure, the war in Eastern Europe that I will be talking about is the World War II, specifically the Nazi occupation of Poland. So here goes. The date was 19 February 1942. The reason why I say the date was 19 February because it happens to be my birthday, but that's completely beside the point. <laughs> so the date was 19 February 1942, and World War II at the time, of course, was in full swing. This was about a month after the notorious Wannsee Conference and less than three months after USA joined the war. On that day, a select audience in Los Angeles witnessed the premiere of a feature film by Ernst Lubitsch about the Nazi occupation of Poland called To Be or Not To Be. This quote from the beginning of one of the most famous Hamlet, uh, Hamlet soliloquies is probably the most recognizable line in the entire Shakespearean canon. And it seems to perfectly capture the precarious moment of the world in 1942, when it was far from clear that Germany would lose. Uh, where the metaphysical question of being took up a very drastic and very real political dim <clears throat> dimension. The film, this film, however, is not a somber piece uh, created to tackle a moment in time which was so obviously out of joint. It is an unabashed comedy with elements of farce filled with theatrical exaggerations. And this led some early critics to reject it. They hated the film. Some of the, some of the critics hated the film. Uh, so Scott Amon, for instance, reports that the National Board of Review magazine liked the film, but warned about a quote-unquote lapse of taste in the picture. The New York Times called the film quote-unquote a callous comedy and wondered where quote the point of contact is between an utterly artificial plot, and it is a bit artificial, a bit forced the plot, uh, and the anguish of a nation which is one of the great tragedies of our time, end of quote. Today the film is viewed uh, and celebrated as a masterpiece. Now, the story begins in Warsaw just before the war, and it revolves around a group of Polish thespians preparing to stage the, their new play. They're, they call it Gestapo. It's harshly critical of, the, of Nazism and its leader, but due to the potential political circumstances with the neighboring Germany, a Polish government official asks them to stop the production of Gestapo, of this play, as the play might provoke the war. So this is just before the war, and they, you know, the Polish government doesn't want to do anything that would um, provoke uh, the worrisome neighbor. At the very outset, this film reminds us that in times of national crisis, the government is arguably within reason to adopt what we could call a platonic stance towards art, where artistic production, and especially theater, must be strictly censored and regulated. Um, and in some sense, it is as if Lubitsch anticipated the, respo the response his film would provoke from critics. Because in a sense, he's making a comedic film about a nation living through an ongoing tragedy in real life, not in itself against the social mores. Is it not tasteless and callous to do art about something as horrible as Holocaust in progress? Should one not opt for something less problematic. In any case, the Polsky Theatre uh, of, of, of the group from the film decides to do precisely that. Instead of performing the politically dangerous Gestapo, they put on a production of Hamlet. Uh, so, you know, as in a sense, Hamlet, you know, who, who cares? Who cares about Hamlet? This is obviously, there's nothing political about Hamlet. Nevertheless, Germany invades Poland and the troop finds itself in the center of a dangerous and sophisticated plot with the survival of the entire Polish resistance at stake, only to save the world in the end after many twists and turns of fortune by using the only trick they are good at, 
theatrical deception. And this extraordinary film can be approached from many angles. My main line of inquiry targets this question. Why do theater and theatricality got to play such a pivotal role in a story dealing with such a dark topic, where not only the destiny of an individual, not only the resolution of the war, but also, this is the thesis here, and I put it forth in all seriousness, the fate of being itself is at stake. Can a theater even support the weight of such enormous political and metaphysical responsibility? In short, why theater in times like this? And we can begin the search for an answer to this question in Shakespeare's Hamlet itself. Freddy Rochem looks at Hamlet as someone who wants to be both a philosopher and a thespian, and a performer, uh, an actor, uh, at the same time. On the one hand, Hamlet is a philosopher, rejecting in a platonic manner all pretense, all theater. Uh, this is from, from, I think, very early on in the play, um, when Gertrude, his mother, urges Hamlet to stop wearing black clothes and other visible signs of mourning, the death of his father, uh, she asks him, uh, you know, what does it seem so particular with, with Hamlet that uh, he's so sad about uh, a very natural occurrence, the death of his father? And Hamlet responds, seems, madam? Nay, it is. I know not seems. So basically, underlining the, the separation between true being on the one hand and mere appearance uh, on, on, on the other hand. And in this regard, we could say that Hamlet shares Plato's distrust of theater, since everything in theater is subordinate to appearance, to what seems, whereas he, the philosopher, is interested in the truth. But on the other hand, the same guy, the same Hamlet, uh, uses for his ultimate test of truth namely of the truth that Claudius murdered his father, uh, he uses a theatrical performance to, to, conduct, to conduct a kind of experiment. He says, the place the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. So Hamlet sets up a theatrical mousetrap, and we'll come back to, to what Lubitsch's mousetrap scene could be uh, in, 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 in this film. Hamlet sets a theatrical mousetrap uh, and he's trying by employing mimesis through a performance of a fictional story similar to that of how his father was murdered, Hamlet hopes to provoke Claudius' a sense of guilt and thus force him into a public confession. This is, this is the plot, right? It is with the help of the very skill of acting, this is, this is what uh, Rokem, I think, very well points out, it is with the very help uh, of the skill of acting, the skill of feigning and doning appearances that the truth will be revealed. This is, uh, this is Hamlet's stake here. So we have both a kind of a platonic position from Hamlet, but also he wants to use uh, theater as a kind of, as, as Rokem describes it, as a kind of a polygraph. Uh, theater is a kind of an epistemological tool to examine whether the king is guilty. And adding onto, on, onto what Rokem describes as, as, as a polygraph, we could add that this mousetrap scene even allows us to claim that Shakespeare employs theater as a kind of a metaphysical tool, or to be more precise, as the very field upon which the question of true being and mere appearances is raised. Indeed, theater is not simply a possible field where this question emerges, it is its necessary field, its native ground. Theatricality is inscribed in being itself. This could be the thesis. Theatricality is inscribed in being itself. Now, if Lubitsch therefore made a war film during wartime and chose to put theater and thespians, actors, in the center of its plot, this can only be seen, I claim, as an homage to Shakespeare. Along with its metaphysical dimension, theater inevitably also has a political dimension. In Lubitsch's film, and especially at the time of its immediate release, this dimension, the political dimension, was obvious, obviously central dimension. At first glance, it would seem that we are offered an alternative, the political play Gestapo versus the metaphysic, metaphysical play Hamlet. Uh, it may seem that we have to make a choice. Either it's time for metaphysical questions or for political actions, to think or to act, to perform or to shoot, 
to make theatre or to make politics? That is the question, we could argue. And yet, Lubitsch's film is a profound rebuttal of such alternatives, which is exactly, of course, why many criticized it initially. Be that as it may, Lubitsch clearly does not see theater as merely apolitical and benign. After all, the hero's triumph over Nazism precisely by performing a theatrical scene at a crucial moment, and we'll get a chance to look at that scene, uh, a theatrical scene at a crucial moment, a scene where a character from the never-realized play Gestapo, which happens to be Adolf Hitler, meets Shylock from Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice. In this case, political liberation was only possible through fidelity to theater and to its metaphysical implications. So this would be sort of kind of my, my entry point into the debate, that political liberation, at least in this film, was only possible through fidelity to theater and even to the metaphysical implications of theater. All right, so how did Lubitsch approach Shakespeare? First of all, the film fully acknowledges the oversaturation of American and European culture, and especially of the English language, with Shakespeare. In the comic tradition, the enormous volume of Shakespeare's work is often tackled through condensation and reduction. Uh, there have been countless productions of the entire opus in a single show. So you would see like the full, the full, the full Shakespeare in one hour or something like that. That's a very, very classic, very common comic procedure. And to an extent, Lubitsch in this film also employs these procedures, as the film includes citations not only from Hamlet and from The Merchant of Venice, but also from Julius Caesar, and is in a broad sense inspired by the comedy of errors and other uh, Shakespearean comedies. The title of the film, To Be or Not To Be, again, could itself be read as a kind of condensation of the entire Shakespeare. If you had to, you know, if you had to, say, if you had to condense the entire Shakespeare into one line, this one would probably be it, right? To be or not to be. But there's a moment in Lubitsch's personal history that seems to already announce the specific approach uh, to Shakespeare that Lubitsch took into Be or Not to Be. Biographies state that at the age of 18, Ernst Lubitsch started taking acting lessons from Victor Arnold, an accomplished comic actor working from the, for you know, the famous uh, German um, director Max Reinhardt. And in the season of 1913-14, Ernst Lubitsch played in no less than five Shakespearean productions in five months. So there was, was like this massive Shakespeare production uh, was going on. Um, but it was always credited the last or very near the bottom of the list. So he played small parts. He, he, he was a minor actor in uh, Marx Reichardt productions. In Hamlet, he played the second grave digger, uh, basically uh, the apprentice of the master clown who played the first grade, grave digger, you know, from the, uh, from the scene just, from the com comic relief scene, if you want, just before the finale, just before everyone uh, gets, gets killed. In the Midsummer Night's Dreams, uh, in Midsummer Night's Dream, he played Tom Stout, the tinker turned amateur actor, who has no more than eight lines in the entire play. Um, and so, what is the significance of Lubitsch playing Tom Stout? Why, why do I think that this sort of biographical detail is is so important? As is typical for Shakespeare, Midsummer Night's Dream, of course, features a play within a play. So the, the plot, it, it takes place in, in, in Athens, but there's a group of amateur actors who perform for, for Athenians a love story, of, a love story of Pyramus and Thisbe uh, to that audience. And in Ovid's story, you might know, uh, Pyramus and Thisbe are young lovers who can't get married because their parents forbid them. It's kind of a Romeo and Juliet story. Uh, it's just that it's Pyramus and Thisbe. But since they live together, um, there's just a wall that separates their rooms, and there's a crack in the wall, and they can communicate through this wall. This is, this is, this is Ovid. Uh, but in this play, within a play, inserted into Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, which is performed by a, a group of amateur actors, which role thus comes to Tom Snout, the, uh, who was played by Lubitsch? Well, you might recall that it's not the role of Pyramus. It's not the role of Thisbe. Uh, Thisbe 
but the role of the wall. Actually, the wall is, uh, has two lines out of eight total lines of, of this minor, minor character. Um, and this particular biographical detail from, from Lubitsch's early, uh, early career reveals, I claim, an important entry point for Lubitsch's to be or not to be. With Snout, we have entered the series of plays within plays, a procedure used throughout this film. But it's not just that Lubitsch uses this procedure, because in truth, he uses it, uses it in other films as well. The point is that the concept of the play within a play determines an essential quality of Lubitsch's Warsaw. And if you agree, I'll use this opportunity to play a little clip from the film, which is uh, the, intr the introductory six-minute uh, long scene from the very beginning of the film. Uh, if you've seen it, you'll love me for playing it for you again. If you haven't seen it, pay attention, because it's a really brilliant scene. So it's six minutes, so take your time, and let's go. Hitler. Anyway, that's, it's a brilliant scene, and every one of these jokes that we've just witnessed it, is worthy of, of a talk itself, I think, to, to delve into um, what things are actually at play in here. But I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to focus on, on, on the play within a play, uh, on the fact that uh, we see a series of plays within a play, where it's never completely clear whether we're supposed to see the actual Warsaw or are we supposed to see a stage of Warsaw or of Gestapo Berlin or whatever? And there's a constant, um, you know, people are constantly coming from the stage on, uh, uh, on the street of Warsaw and back. It's very unclear where we are, actually. If, 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 there's, if, if there's Warsaw, if there's the stage, it doesn't seem like the Warsaw that we are seeing is anything but a stage. In a way, and this is this is what um, this is what Elizabeth Bronfen, Bronfen uh, underlines in in commenting on this uh, on, on this brilliant um, opening sequence. So she remarks that Warsaw, as the location of the film, is determined as a stage. This is this is how we get to know Warsaw. It's a stage. When the film shows us the streets of Warsaw, the buildings we saw are very obviously elements of a stage set as if we were deliberately reminded that we have never left the stage. Bronfen writes, I quote, Warsaw in To Be or Not To Be is thus marked from the start as an urban stage, located outside, but comparable, comparable to the stage of Polsky theater itself, end of quote. Why? Bronfen claims that the reason for this deliberate alienation is basically the same as with all war films. Since a film cannot directly stage the real horror of a war um, range, raging in the real world, something Bronfen calls the real of war, it is actually much more honest and also much more effective to explicitly address this distance. That is to say, a war film tends to explicitly understand itself as a cinematic staging, as a cinematic staging of the war. Des describing this sequence in To Be or Not To Be, uh, sorry, not this sequence, but the sequence where we see German troops marching through what is obviously a theatric scenery of bombarded Warsaw, and we'll come back to that scene in a moment, Bronfen writes, I quote, the extreme stylization of, uh, of the transitional sequence serves more as a shield than a cover-up. It obliquely points to the horrific catastrophe it cannot directly represent." End of quote. Now this procedure I'm interested in, this procedure of intentional stylization, of explicitly staging its drama, this hyper-theatricality of Lubitsch's film, can be rendered in a well-known Shakespearean proclamation, all the world's a stage. However, in the case of Lubitsch at least, I think we should phrase it more specifically, all the world's a play within a play. The point is not that all our life's endeavors are, are nothing but a stage performance in the sense of an illusion. This is why I do not think that film, any film actually, or indeed art in general, should properly be considered as a kind of psychic shield uh, to guard us from the unrepresentable real of the catastrophe. The point I claim is rather that the illusion of the film, uh, of the film staging, is the only way for the real 
to articulate or manifest itself. So we require this illusion in order for the real to manifest itself. It's not a kind of a shield against the real, it's required in order for the real to actually appear for us. So a kind of primordial theatricality of the real itself, this would be the second thesis, I suppose. In short, this is the basic paradox of the film. What is at stake in to be or not to be politically, including the confrontation with the real of war, is phrased in terms of a play within a play. However, this hyper-theatricality of the film does not amount to a suspension or discharge of the political. So we're not relieved of our ethical duties or stance towards uh, what is going on. Quite to the contrary, this deliberately, 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 I'm sorry, oblique approach through theater serves to even sharpen and articulate the film's, the film's political point. All right, let's go now to The Merchant of Venice. Uh, let us take a closer look now uh, at how this process of a play within a play works in Lubitsch's film. Since the film couples Shakespeare with the Nazi occupation of Poland, it comes as no surprise that we hear no less than three versions of the Shylock monologue have not a Jew eyes uh, from The Merchant of Venice. In all three cases, the monologue is delivered by Greenberg, um, just so you'll know which guy is Greenberg. So this guy is, oh, sorry. So this guy is Greenberg, uh, and Bronski is Hitler, right? So Greenberg is the Jew, and, uh, or the Jew in the troupe, and Bronski is uh, the little actor who plays Hitler. And he has to be, a, it's a silent part. It's a very minor part that he has to play. Anyway, these are the guys. Um, so in all three cases, the monologue is delivered by Greenberg, who was played by Felix Bressart, a German Jewish actor, actual, actual German Jewish actor, to his companion Bronski, uh, who's another minor actor playing, uh, playing Hitler. The first instance of the monologue happens at the very beginning of the film, actually very soon after this uh, initial opening sequence, just before the invasion of Poland, off stage. The two clowns of the troupe, we can easily, we can easily imagine them uh, playing the two grave diggers in Hamlet, dream about taking on big roles while having to settle for portraying more spear bearers. All right. So. <laughs> All right. Let's end it here. Okay. So again, we see we see this seamless uh, transition from they just talking them just talking into the quote. Right. Uh, it's obviously a quote from Shakespeare, but the transition into it is is seamless. It, you know, the the actor just starts talking about. Shakespeare must have thought of me. It's me. Have I not eyes? I mean, it's, it's completely seamless. Um, it's not a direct quote, though. Uh, the part with reference to Christians is cut, and the word Jew is replaced with a pronoun. So we never hear, in the film, we never hear the word Jew at all, which is, of course, extremely significant. Um, but I will not comment on it uh, much further. Uh, it's, it's very important uh, in the film that the word Jew is never mentioned. It's always replaced with a pronoun. Um, and Greenberg, who is one of the heroes in the film, in the end um, disappears from, from, the, from the happy ending of the film, which is also kind of significant here. But we'll not, we'll, let's just leave it there. Now, again, I want to go back to my topic and say that what is remarkable about this scene is that in response to Nazism, Lubitsch does not attempt to give the victims of this Holocaust in progress. This is 1942, I'll just remember, uh, just remind you. He does not attempt to give the vi victims of the Holocaust in progress an authentic voice to defend their humanity. Instead of giving the Polish jury a platform to speak uh, from their own voice, in Greenberg, Lubitsch simply shows us an actor who wants the same thing every actor wants, to play a major role in a Shakespearean production. So what is the authentic voice of the Jew? According to Lubitsch, the Jew sounds awfully lot like Shakespeare. His authentic claim is a quote. And to make matters even more interesting, there is some sort of quoting at work even in Shakespeare's version of the Shylock monologue itself. The soliloquy Greenberg is quoting begins as Shylock's justification for his demand for a pound of Antonio's flesh. So this is the, the background. It's not the Rialto scene. There's, a, there's a, a little bit of a mistake here on Lubitsch's part. It's not the Rialto scene. It's another scene um, where 
Another merchant, Salario, asks Shylock, okay, but why do you want a pound of his flesh? I mean, what are you going to do with that? It's ridiculous. It's just vile. And Shylock says, I quote, if it will feed nothing else, it will feed my revenge. Antonio disrespected, scorned and injured, injured Shylock half a million times only because he was a Jew. It is in this context that Shylock starts reciting, quote, have not, a Jew's, have not a Jew eyes, have not a Jew hands, organs, dementia, senses, affections, passions. If you poison us, do we not die? And if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? He wants revenge, of course. If we are like you, like Christians, in the rest, we will resemble you in that. The villain you teach me, I will execute. This is how he ends his uh, justification. The villainy you teach me, you Christians teach me, I will execute. And this speech, of course, is a rhetorical masterpiece, as we would expect from, from Shakespeare. Sherlock fully acknowledges that his demand is vile. He does not shy away from this. But a Jew is the same as a Christian in every aspect, not just the organ's dimensions, but also in wanting revenge. Wanting revenge is no exception. Shalak does not, evoke, does not evoke some cultural, ethnic, or religious characteristic in it to Jews that supposedly justifies his demand. So contrary to you uh, Christians who believe in mercy, I, a Jew, believe in revenge, whatever, he does not evoke that. He says, I am the same as you Christians in villainy. I'm, I'm, I'm simply a, 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 an apprentice of you. In a way, what I'm saying is I'm a quote of you. I'm, it's not just the organs that manages, is, is my revenge itself is something that I'm uh, just quoting from you. All right, there are two further repetitions of the Shylock speech within the film, and together they form a kind of a Hegelian triad. I can't escape Hegel, I guess. So, but don't worry, I'll not go very much into Hegel at all. The first repetition was comical, even farcical. You, um, the war has not begun yet, the tone of the film is still fairly light, Greenberg, uh, Greenberg apparently made a big impression on his colleague Bronsky, who says, you'd move them to tears. For the film's audience, for us, however, of course, the scene is clearly comical. The actors appear in wrong costumes, right, from a wrong Shakespearean production. And when Greenberg delivers his punchline, if you poison us, do we not die, he overdoes it and almost blows the wig off uh, Bronsky's head. So it's a farcical gag what we see here. We see, you know, we, we see uh, the Sherlock monologue in a farce, in a, in a kind of a farce. And we, the audience of the film, are, are certainly not moved to tears. But then there's the second instance of the speech, which happens on the street of Warsaw after the German invasion, during a transitional sequence. And that part, as you'll see, of course, is a little bit different, the undertone is tragic so just let me find so again what i'm what i'm interested in is how lubitsch is using shakespeare in this scene this is this is again what i'm interested in uh christian denslov comments that i quote by borrowing these lines from shakespeare lubitsch lends a sense of gravitas and authority to the scene this is this is why he uses shakespeare to to uh, to to amplify the the tragedy she adds that, I quote, Lubitsch borrows Shakespeare's lines in order to speak out more forcefully against the Holocaust without formally speaking, about, uh, speaking out against the Holocaust, end of quote. And we can agree with this in principle, but it doesn't really explain, and this is what I'm actually interested in, it doesn't really explain the curious functioning of authority. Uh, um, a veritable paradox whereby authority is not diminished by someone expressing their plight by borrowing words from a fictional narrative. It is actually enhanced by this procedure. We are dealing with the same kind of paradox Elizabeth Bronfen mentioned uh, with regard to the war films in general. The explicit reference to the fact that the war we are watching is staged paradoxically increases the film's realism. The film is more realistic because it is obviously theatrical. This is, this is the paradox that she points out, and I think we're dealing with the same kind of uh, problem here. A similar, a similar principle of what I call play within a play apparently holds also in the case of staging one's own injury. So even, even, even in the modus of tragedy, 
the same sort of principle applies. The setting and the mood clearly produce a tragic undertone to the second instance of the monologue, but even here, Lubitsch makes sure that the tragic voice is not presented as a kind of an authentic position, but rather as a quote. Even in the genre of tragedy, the voice of the disgraced and injured is not an authentic voice, but words borrowed from a stage character. Lubitsch never wants us to forget that. In fact, he masterfully plays with our perception when, of course, Bronski comments, uh, compliments Greenberg's performance of the Polish Jew. So we're seeing a performance of the Polish Jew, and Bronski says, what a shallock you would have been. Even, even in, 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 in a tragic mode, we see this same kind of uh, hyper-theatrical gesture. Even in the tragic genre, the political position of the film is hyper-theatrical. It does not claim an immediate authentic position, rather it performs it. Its authority comes through the suspense of the authenticity. How are we with time, Peter? About uh, 45 minutes. 45 minutes, I'm speaking already. Yeah. Oh my god, I have, whoo, I have so much more. Um, <laughs> darn. Okay, I'll just cut it short then and just go to the third and final uh, monologue. Uh, and then we can do the rest of it in, um, uh, in discussion if there's questions. So there's a third and final um, instance of the monologue, uh, which is the climax of the film. And everything depends on Greenberg and Bronski performing their parts perfectly. This time around, the genre is neither simply comedy nor simply tragedy. The band of thespians has successfully thwarted the Gestapo's attempt to destroy the Polish underground resistance, but they are now in trouble themselves. The, their plan is truly a daring one. Uh, I'm just you know, giving you the plot just before we see the final instance of, of, uh, of this monologue. So what do they plan? What do the thespians plan? They will impersonate Adolf Hitler and his entourage, hijack the Führer's plane, and escape to England. Obviously, this is a comedy, right? I mean, outside of comedy, this would uh, not be possible. And this final scene takes place in a corridor of a theater where Adolf Hitler, Adolf Hitler is personally attending the celebration of the victory over Poland. Uh, and Inside the theater hall, soldiers start singing a very long version of the song of the Germans, uh, Deutschland über alles, which allows us to hear the anthem in the background of what follows. So let's just jump to that. Yeah, they turn this man and bring him to my headquarters. I want a question. All right, I'll, I'll just stop it here. Uh, so the rest is, the rest is uh, simple in a way. The deception was successful. Hitler's personal guard is convinced that they prevented a genuine attack on, 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 on the Fuhrer, and our heroes quickly leave the scene, hidden in plain sight, escorted to safety by German troops themselves. Now, everything in this scene depends on minor actors, on Bronsk and Grimberg, performing their parts well. On, 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 on Grimberg keep, keeping, uh, sorry, on Bronsky keeping his mouth shut, just play the silent part. Um, and, you know, will Bronski be, be a convincing Hitler? The film already established that at the very beginning. But will Greenberg also be a convincing Jew? This is a stroke of genius, I think, in this scene. How does a Jew convincingly perform the part of the Jew? How can a Jew convince us that he really is a Jew, that he is a, a, a danger to Hitler? And Lubitsch's answer is simple. He must perform the Shylock monologue. The stunning logic here relies on what Hegel described as the logic of the essence. For Hegel, the truth is not that which lies beyond appearances. Instead, it is truth only as much as it appears. So the, the quote goes, truth would not be truth if it did not show itself and appear. End of quote. What is at stake here is the paradoxical notion that authenticity itself is something performed. Authenticity is not that which remains beyond appearances, beyond the actions that one performs, as Hamlet puts it. Rather, it is precisely what appears in those appearances and is enacted in those actions. The Hegelian concept of truth is most clearly and recognizably at work in the comic formula of a person's identity, 
Precisely because the relationship between truth and appearance is a productive one, comedy can exploit with great effect um, the motif of the double uh, or the idea of the mistaken identity. And Lubitsch's film, uh, for those of you who've watched it, you, you know this, it's a true masterpiece of the figure of the double. And so this final version of the Shalak monologue is also the only one in which we hear the words, and if you wrong us, shall we not revenge? The absence of this crucial line in the first two instances of the monologue only underlines its importance for Lubitsch. So even though this is, again, the same point that I'm trying to convey throughout this whole speech, uh, as noted above, the scene is neither simply comic nor tra tragic. Perhaps it is a kind of a revenge tragedy. You know, just like in Glorious Busters, there's an element of that. And towards the end of the film, we see uh, the, uh, uh, we see that the Polish resistance has started bombing uh, Nazi headquarters. So maybe Hitler even dies in the film, even though, you know, that's not that's not the plot, but it's imaginable. Um, it's very rare, actually, that films would show Hitler dying, right? Like films really like his persona as someone untouchable, someone. We, in this film, we don't even see his real face, right? Uh, but we rarely see, Inglorious Buster is one of the few examples where they kill Hitler. It's, it's, it's a very rare thing to see. Um, and the German anthem that plays behind the Shylock monologue further signals to us that the stakes are immense at this final uh, instance of the monologue. Even though everything in the scene is deliberately staged, so that we witness a series of performances nested within performances, a performance for Bronski in, uh, nested in a performance for the German troops surrounding them, nested in a performance for us, the film viewers. This is obviously, even though it's hyper-theatrical, it's obviously the dramaturgical summit of the film, binding all of its threads into one. And perhaps we could claim that the genres of comedy and tragedy are superseded in this scene by their political punch. We literally see a confrontation between the personification of the Nazi and the personification of the Jew, Hitler and Shylock. It seems that the scene's tragic undertone only serves to bolster its comic procedure, and its comic procedure only serves to strength, th strengthen its tragic heroic stance. The crucial point to make here is that this gesture of the overcoming of the genres of comedy and tragedy, which is the absolutely serious political point of the film, of course, is not at the same time a suspension of theatricality. We never lose that. We never lose that from, uh, in this film. Quite to the contrary, the ultimate expression of the film's political stance takes place in the context of a hyper-theatrical performance. The film's political punch lies precisely in its theatricality. And this is why I claimed in the beginning that, at least in this film, the world was saved through fidelity to theater and to metaphysics, if you want, to the questions of being and appearance. All right. I have one thing more, but I'll, you know. Go for it. Yeah. Should I go for it? Sure. All right. Cool. Let's go for it. I see some Slovenian friends are tired already, but <laughs> we want to see Lubitsch, uh, Lubitsch's final punch. All right. Let us return to Hamlet, then, and the mousetrap scene, which I promised in the beginning, as the quintessential play within a play. Stanley Cavell, um, Stanley Cavell argued that it, it is the central scene of Hamlet, in a sense, uh, the, the mousetrap scene, the key to the play as a whole. In Freudian terms, Cavell understood it as the primal scene of the play, the Ostszene. More specifically, Cavell's argument is that the dumb show in the mousetrap scene, you know, the puppets or whatever, the dumps, uh, that the dump show in the Master of Scene should, should be interpreted as Hamlet's primal fantasy, as a play through which Hamlet was able to engage with his own primal scene, the Freudian Urszene, with the traumatic core of his existence. Cavell concludes that we could see, I quote, the dump show as the play's figure for itself, end of quote. Adding that this, does not, that this doesn't mean that the dumb show repeats the play in miniature. It's not just a condensation. Cavell's point is rather that the dumb show is how the play fantasizes about its own traumatic core, which is to say, about itself. Now, taking the cue from Cavell, 
what would be the traumatic core in the case of Lubitsch's to be or not to be. Now, without a doubt, this traumatic core is the Holocaust, with everything it implies, World War II, concentration camps, Nazism. But is there a scene in to be or not to be that we may, following Cavell's example, understand as the film's figure for itself, as the film's dump show, not a repetition in miniature, but rather as the primal scene of the film. And one possible candidate for this would, of course, be the series of the Shalak monologues, or, or, or the very scene we've just watched. Another possibility is the series of Hamlet monologues in the film, which we haven't even discussed. The film is so rich. Delivered by Josef Tura, the main, uh, the, the protagonist, basically, of the film, playing Hamlet, in the Polsky Theater production of Shakespeare's, Shakespeare's play. However, I believe that it is a third series of encounters which results in the scene that we may call the primal fantasy of the film as such. A series of encounters between Josef Tura, this actor, uh, this Polish actor, and the SS Colonel Erhard. At the level of appearances, these encounters, it's three encounters, it's, they're all extremely funny. Uh, if you haven't yet watched the film, you'll enjoy these encounters very much. Uh, at the level of appearances, these encounters are always meeting, meetings between a Nazi spy called Professor Siletsky and Colonel Erhard. However, these two never actually meet in person. The Nazi spy and the, the, the SS office, uh, the SS Colonel Erhard, they never meet, actually meet in person because one of the roles is always played by our Josef Tura. So in their first, uh, in their first meeting, it's actually Josef Tura disguised as Colonel Erhard, who is meeting the real Professor Siletsky, the real spy, trying to get information from him. And then in their next meeting, we see, uh, we see Colonel Erhard, the real Colonel Erhard, meeting Josef Tura, now disguised with a fake beard and all. Uh, the Professor Siletsky, uh, this evil spy, the only truly evil person in this film. And then the final meeting, their final meeting is again meeting of the Professor Siletsky and, uh, and, uh, uh, and the Colonel Erhard. However, in this final instance, the SS is on to him. They already know that it's actually the actor who is just uh, pretending to be Professor Siletsky, to be the spy because they have already found the dead body of the dead spy, of Professor Siletsky. All right? And we're going to see this uh, masterful, truly masterful um, scene, which I claim to be uh, the Urszene of the film as such. All right. So I I'm going to claim that it's a ma mousetrap. So I'll invite you to, to see it as, as, as a version of Lubitsch's version of, of mousetrap. All right. Let's see. Let's see this. <laughs> All right. Okay, so that second part is just brilliant because uh, it's really so superfluous. We really, really didn't need that. Like the uh, the scene didn't need that. It was just added, just more comedy to it. Um, but yeah, I watched it because it, you know. Anyway, uh, what I want to comment on is the following: um, if we are allowed to see this scene, this, the, the you know the first part of the scene as the film's mousetrap scene. This is what I invited you to see, right? then we may be surprised to see who is playing Hamlet here. Apparently, it's the SS Colonel Erhard who's actually playing Hamlet. It was Erhard who set the stage, uh, who instructed his, uh, his actors. There is only one dumb actor, the dead body of Siletsky, but its performers, a performance is all the more accusing. It is Erhard who wishes to ascertain the truth through the means of theater, who wants to find the murderer by playing with the imposter's guilt, right? I mean, he, he actually uh, says that you can murder a man, you can, but you cannot uh, pull a man's beard. So he wants to play with the imposter's guilt. And after all, it is Tura who is the obvious imposter. Uh, the Claudius of the scene, right? He's the false, he's pretending to be someone else. However, things turn out quite differently than Erhard expected. And the mousetrap spectacularly backfires. When Tura asks to play the detective and performs a show where he tries to determine who the real Siletsky is, Tura already won. 
The question that motivates Erhard in this sequence, namely, who is the real Siletsky, turns out to be the wrong question. It is Stura who poses the correct question, which is, who is the real Hamlet? In this instance, this equates to who is better at playing Hamlet. The moment when Tura is allowed to play the detective, which is of course precisely what Hamlet is doing uh, in the preparation to and during the mousetrap scene, it becomes clear that Erhard is defeated and that his trap for Tura has become, has become a trap for Erhard himself. And of course, the question of who is the real Hamlet is of the utmost importance for us, the viewers, as well. Gerd Gemünden analyzes Lubitsch's work in the perspective of German exile filmmaking. Uh, Gemünden points out that Lubitsch's film keeps the viewer fooled, quote, by events that look staged and phony, but are indeed real, and by what appears real or normal, but is in fact staged, end of quote. Gemünden, too, similar to what Braunfen suggests and to what uh, I suggest here, understands Lubitsch's strategy here as a honing of the Shakespearean principle that all the world's a stage as a strategy where performance and politics are one and the same. What is crucial in Gemünden's contribution is his remark that the dimension of what he calls performativity and what we could simply uh, refer to as theatricality plays a crucial role in the constitution of the Nazi regime of power. I quote, as the German exiles uh, were well aware, the might of Nazi dictatorship rested on its ability for making power visible, end of quote from Gemünden. The point is not simply that the Nazi regime of power appreciated theatrical displays of marches, parades, and rallies, but that its grasp over population depended on such displays to such an extent that we may even argue that its power existed in them, in, in those parades, in those theatrical displays, though Gemunden himself stops short of claiming that. Now, even though Colonel Erhard is clearly a comical character, a wonderful actor, actually, we kind of love, we, we begin to love SS Colonel Erhard through this film, um, and certainly doesn't represent the fearsomeness of the Gestapo, his theatricality nevertheless exposes something deeply true about Nazism. If I claim that the final meeting of Erhard and Tura should be considered as the primal scene of the film, as the way in which the film figures itself, then what I claim is that the primal fantasy of the film is the contest over who is the real Hamlet. Again, one might argue that in the context of World War II, this is a ridiculous question. We are, after all, in the middle of war, and the fate of theater and metaphysics will just have to wait. However, this kind of argu argument, this kind of reasoning, misses the point that what was at stake in World War II was far more than merely a question of the domination on the battlefield. At the core of it, just like in the Cold War that followed, there was the question of the ideological domination and fate of the modern subjectivity as such. And in this context, Hamlet's importance can scar scarcely be overstated. And on this point, I'll have to thank Tatiana Jukic, who uh, pointed this out brilliantly in one of his recent papers. So, you know, the importance of Hamlet for the constitution of modern subjectivity. Uh, and I guess, you know, the argument that I'm trying to make here, I'll just uh, make it a little bit more compact and say that uh, what's at stake is, you know, who is the Hamlet here? Uh, is, it, is, it, is, it, is it Colonel Erhard who wants to play Hamlet, uh, who sees the occupation of Poland as a kind of his chance um, uh, to play Hamlet, basically, to, 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 to take part in this war as a kind of Shakespearean um, theater? Uh, or is it, or is it, um, or is it Josef Tura, uh, a, a very unlikely Hamlet, uh, played by radio personality Jack Benny, uh, a kind of anti-fascist Hamlet, uh, as, uh, well, yes, as 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 as, as an anti-fascist version of modernity. And so I'll end with, um, I'll just end with uh, one of the lines that was very important for Lubitsch in this film, where I think he explicitly. Quite explicitly, Lubitsch, I think, addresses this, this question. So in one of the encounters, uh, brilliant encounters of the film, Tura, this guy, the Siletsky with the fake beard and everything, but still not wanting to miss a chance to toot his own horn, 
Josef Tura uh, asks Kölner Erhard whether he knew a certain individual, that great, great Polish actor Josef Tura. So he wants to, you know, kind of make a, uh, you know, make, make himself big. And Erhard responds to Tura's disappointment, and Erhard, SS Colonel Erhard responds, "Oh yes, as a matter of fact, I saw him on a stage when I was in Warsaw once before the war." What he did to Shakespeare, we are doing now to Poland. So what he did to Shakespeare, we are doing now to Poland. Scott Amon reports that this line was met with dead silence during that uh, first screening uh, in, in Los Angeles in 1942. Even Lubitsch's close friends and wife thought that he should cut this line from the film. Because it basically establishes, quote unquote, a daring analogy between the rape of a nation with the aesthetic rape of a playwright. So how dare you? You know, someone is a bad actor and there, there's a Holocaust. How dare you put this, uh, how, how dare you put this in a kind of parallel, Lubitsch. But Lubitsch did it. He, he stayed, this line stayed in the film. Uh, it's very important for the film and I suggest we take it quite seriously and read it literally. In the eyes of Erhard himself, the Nazi occupation of Poland is a theatrical performance of Shakespearean proportions in which he gets to play Hamlet. What the Nazis were doing on the level of political theater and political metaphysics should not be dismissed as harmless. It should be taken seriously as an essential part of what they were doing on the level of political reality in occupied, in occupied Poland. So reading this encounter between Tura and Erhard as the film's mousetrap scene therefore implies understanding the primal fantasy of 1942 as the confrontation between two Hamlets, between two visions of modern subjectivity, between a Nazi vision personified in Colonel Erhardt and an anti-fascist vision personified in this most unlikely ham Hamlet uh, imaginable, Josef Tura, uh, played by Jack Benny. So while the, sh the film is an unashamed comedy, it nevertheless presents to us a completely serious claim that theater is the stage for both political and metaphysical confrontation of our time, of our age. Comedy and theatricality are not offered as a kind of a relief from deadly serious situation in the world, but precisely as the means to engage with that situation. So I suppose I'll just end this talk with a quote from Lubitsch, who wrote uh, in response to his critics uh, at the time, Lubitsch wrote, I quote, I was tired of two established recognized recipes, drama with comedy relief and comedy with dramatic relief. I had, made up, I had made up my mind to make a picture with no attempt to relieve anybody from anything at any time. End of quote. Thank you.